Welcome to Coaching Uncaged, the podcast on all things coaching, brought to you by Animas. And now introducing your host, Yannick Jacob. Wow, Jerry Colonna. Um, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Yannick. It was, it's really a delight to be here. And as I said, it's a, it's a real honor to be with you today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I've been waiting to talk to you for a little while. You didn't know that I've been waiting to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, the message didn't come through. No, I did not know. <laughs> um, the first time I came across your work, I hate reading bios, right? Your bio is very impressive. So uh, if you Google a bio and Jerry Colonna, you get to your website, uh, you have a very illustrious career and a very uh, inspiring story. Um, in your, your, I, I just moved to Berlin, uh, hence uh, viewers of the podcast, uh, they will notice uh, this looks a bit different. Uh, but I literally just had uh, 12 hours in the car uh, listening to your book again. So uh, it's, it's, been, it's been nice to spend this time with you because you really reveal a lot about who you are and what's shaped you. And you tell a lot of stories from clients and what has shaped them. Um, so it's really, really interesting to see because the, you can read a bio of people, right? You, you've been in, uh, you've been, you've done um, uh, JP Morgan Ch um, Chase. You've been an investor. Um, you've been in, um, uh, you've been a coach for what, 20 years now? Um, Almost, yeah. 18. Yes. You've uh, written that book, you know, you've uh, been a leader at age 25. Book two sitting here on the on the desk as I've been working my way through it. So <laughs> amazing. So there's a lot there, right? Uh, but there's a lot more that is revealed when you actually get into the human story. So um, thank you, first of all, for revealing this because, you know, it's, it doesn't go without saying. And to some extent, I want to get into that. And I think it's impossible not to. Um, but yeah, um, I wonder where to start. Um, and well, let me just thank you for for uh, go, working your way through the book again a second time, um, and thank you for the kind words about it. Um, it is there. It was very much a labor of love, and um, I think the experience of putting myself out there is as clearly as I did, I have a, a belief that there's something magical about memoir as service, um, mm -hmm. you know, as a point of um, departure, if you mm -hmm. will, for a deeper inquiry. Mm -hmm. And um, as I often say, it's really important for those of us who hold power to go first. And by dint of having a platform like a book, I have a certain kind of power in that relationship. Um, and so the obligation is to show up fully and authentically and to mm -hmm. go first. And then right. magic happens when um, those who lead go first and, mm -hmm. and, and then go quiet at that yeah. point. But so thank you for those kind words. So there's two points that I wanted to pick you up on. I think they're a good way to start. Um, the first one is going first. And the second one is deep inquiry. So um, let me start with the first ones first, right? Because uh, often coaches get trained and, you know, there's this debate about, well, should we self-disclose? Does our own story matter? You know, shall we reveal ourselves? Um, do we go first? And I wonder to what extent that transfers into your coaching work. Great question. And, you know, my first um, coaching experience was actually a therapy experience where I, I, you know, as I describe in the book, I worked with a psychoanalyst for almost 30 years. <clears throat> After she passed, God rest her soul, um, I began working with another psychoanalyst. So I continued to, to, to hold that stance. And the traditional methodology is that the, um, which actually has its roots in Freud, has this notion of the analyst disappearing so that transference can happen. Mm. Yeah, that they don't, way. <laughs> they don't go first. <laughs> yeah. And so there is a, there is a um, very important 
question around that with regard to um, the coaching relationship. And of course, transference does occur in the coaching relationship and there is something even therapeutic about it, although it is not therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I, sorry, can um, I jump in there briefly mm -hmm. uh, for those people who are listening, watching, who might not be familiar with transference? Could you just frame that? Sure. Transference is the process by which uh, uh, either the coach or the therapist becomes someone else in the psyche of the client. Mm -hmm. So um, probably because of my dashing silver gray hair, I become everybody's father. Um, you know, I'm being simplistic in it. It's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more complex than that, but mm -hmm. being aware of the potentiality of transference is extremely important. Now transference occurs in almost all relationships. It's mm -hmm. like, you're just like my father. No, <laughs> I'm not, you know, but, but that whole experience. And so very much linked to projection, which is mm -hmm. another, uh, experience. In therapy, um, a good therapist is trained to use the transferential relationship such that they can help the client work through issues that they might not have otherwise worked through. Mm -hmm. So if the client, if the client feels that the coach is attacking them and they get on the defense, that's probably something that they've projected into their coach based on another relationship and a yeah. good coach or therapist will pick that up. And That's right. That's right. Now it's also incumbent upon the coach to understand that they may in fact be attacking the client. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's happened. There may in fact be a transference relationship going on there. <laughs> Excuse me. So there's that going on. But but to to your first question, which I think is fascinating, is I think it's it's critically important to understand what it is that the coach is up to when they're speaking. Um, you know, I, I've told this story before early on in my coach training program, I had a, uh, 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 a teacher who in lit, in reviewing a coaching session that I had had a recorded session, she, she gave me the acronym W A I T wait, uh, which stands for why am I talking? Yeah. yeah I love that. And, uh, sometimes the coach might Uh, go first, to use the language we were talking before, to satisfy an ego need that they have. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes they may be going first because of their own transferential uh, experience. But sometimes the coach is going first to create safety. Mm -hmm. um, and that you have to, it's very tricky. You have to be very, very careful because you don't want to collude with the, the client's unconscious and wipe them out if they have the tendency to see themselves as diminished in some ways. Mm -hmm. That all said, from a leader perspective, from one who holds power perspective, I think it's, it's, it's important. When I say go first, I mean, demonstrate the qualities and values that you mm -hmm. wish to see in the world mm -hmm. by going first. Mm -hmm. So if I wish that my organization more transparent in its values and authentic in its presentation and of high integrity, mm -hmm. well, then guess what? Mm -hmm. I have to do those things. Mm -hmm. I can't just state it and expect it to happen, least of all from folks who are trying to stay safe in an environment that may feel uh, wholly unsafe to them. Mm -hmm. So that was a long-winded response to a fascinating question. So I've heard coaching being referred to as leadership, even equated to. And mm -hmm. uh, re-listening to your book, listening to some of the passages, thinking about the role of the coach when you described the role of the leader was really interesting because a lot of it fits, but a lot of it is also different depending on how you think about coaching. So I wonder to what extent, if at all, uh, the role of the coach is a role of a leader. I think it, 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 uh, a, it's a nuance, but slightly, but important difference is to think of the leader as coach rather than the coach as leader. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about the, the things that I think are hallmarks of uh, skillful leadership, mm -hmm. they include uh, the extensive use of open, honest questions, 
non-agenda based questions, mm -hmm. curiosity, inquiry, mm -hmm. um, uh, self management, mm -hmm. um, the ability to, as I often say, have one eye on what's going on inside of me and one eye on what's going on outside so that I'm uh, operating in a regulated and high integrity way. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, there's a challenge if the coach thinks of themselves as a leader, excuse me, then, um, and, and sometimes we see that, right? We see that when a coach conflates mentorship with coaching, mm -hmm. um, where, and I know of one person who builds himself as a coach who does this, who says, well, wait, I'll run your meeting for you, then you do it exactly the way I did. <laughs> and you're smiling because that's not coaching. Mm -hmm. I mean, we both know that, right? In fact, that's disabling of the client's um, capacity uh, and agency, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, as, as we all know, those of us who are participating in this grand experiment called coaching, one of the core tenets of coaching is that the client is whole and not deficient. Mm -hmm. And the challenge with the coach as a leader, as a, as, as a structure, as a stance, may inadvertently aggravate the client's view of themselves as less than capable, less than mm -hmm. sufficient. Mm -hmm. And that's not our job. Yeah. Nah, it can be really difficult to hold back what we think we know, right? There's a million different ways to lead. There's a million different ways to coach, but it creeps in for many coaches that, oh, I kind of know the answers. And given everything that you've done in your life, it, that must come up for you. Uh, I wonder. Well, it comes up all the time. It, yeah. it, how, it how do you manage that? All the time. Um, I, I generally will acknowledge uh, if I'm going to take the coach hat off in that moment in the conversation and say something like, uh, my favorite phrases are things like, I'm going to put aside coaching and I'm going to mentor a little bit, right? And But I want you to understand that you're free to accept or reject what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. Or I might say, hey, I'm going to be your brother right now. I'm not going to be your coach or I'm going to be your uncle, not mm -hmm. right and what I'm trying to do is name the different stances that can arise. Right. Now, in my case, what does happen often is um, there might be a very complex situation that's going on. Say a client's company is fundraising and they're in a negotiation with uh, an investor. And um, I will note that I can offer some suggestions, but not from the stance of a coach. Mm -hmm. And as long as the relationship uh, is trusting enough and open and honest enough, it tends to work. Mm -hmm. um, and my clients in particular appreciate that. Um, what's critically important is that the coach understand when they're coaching and when they're not coaching. Mm -hmm and are able to distinguish between those two. And I'm not sure that that's always the case for folks. Huh. Yeah, I, I find that once I open the door into putting some helpful things on the table, potentially, and letting the client see if there's any value in that, or, once you open that suggestion or advice door, I find that clients will want more and more of that. It's difficult to close it again. Did you find, do you find that as well? I find it less difficult to close it again. And I know exactly what you mean. I, I do I do understand that. Um, sometimes that may be an indication that the client uh, lacks confidence in themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, and I would advise a CEO to do the same thing. In that moment, pause and turn it into a question. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you did have a sense of what you knew to, what you would do, what do you think would come up for you? Mm -hmm. Who might you ask for additional, right? And so all of a sudden it starts to become more open-ended, open and honest questions. Yeah. A technique I often use uh, when I find myself uh, being asked for that by a, 
a client is I'll often say something like, I understand that it would feel good if I gave you a my point of view or my answer to that question, which of course is different than anybody else's answer. But humor me for a moment. Hmm. I'll get back to that advice moment in a moment, but humor me for a moment. What would happen? And then I use that as a separate uh, setup for, for the question. What I have found is that if, if you can, if you can um, redirect it in that moment, the client very often finds themselves with that uh, finding their own answer, which is that's the holy grail, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so if you ever hear me in a podcast say, humor me for a moment, <laughs> that's usually an indication that I'm feeling what you're just talking about and shifting the energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I, I really like that. And I think it's a nice segue as well. At that point, it becomes goes from something transactional to something relational, right? You're yes. picking up on a dynamic, something that's happening here and now between us. Um, you know, there might be some transference going on. There might be a parallel process. There might be some projection, but it's a, the curiosity about what's happening between us that opens the door into exploring other relationships you've had in your life where this kind of stuff emerges. And well, how, does, this, how does it feel for you when a client does that to you? Oh, usually I'm the one doing that. I wish more clients would do it. <laughs> you know, you, well, I, I wish more I mean, clients would client, pick up on. Well, I mean, when the client is asking you for advice, hmm. how does it feel for you? Oh, well, a part of me always feels on the spot, right? Uh, and that is still something that emerges. Now I don't respond to that anymore because I feel I don't have to offer the advice just because I'm asked. So uh, that's a really so, freeing position because we've had that contract in place, right? So at one point you felt like you had to give them the advice. Is that right? Yeah, I think a lot of coaches when they're starting out, I think it's an experience for most that uh, they feel they need to deliver this value thing. And uh, if it can feel uncomfortable in the beginning to sit there and the not knowing and we not, don't know together. Um, so. Now I set my coaching up in a way that that's not an expectation. And if that's an expectation, that opens the door into asking questions and where's that coming from and what are we doing here and how do we do these things? So, you know, occasionally uh, when I supervise, for example, coaches, I've specifically allowed myself to put some advice on the table occasionally and see what the coach does with that. But uh, I, I really, I'm, I don't, I'm very careful with it, let's say because I don't want to have coaches mimic me or be the kind of coach that I am. I want them to be the kind of coach that they are. Um, and that, that transfers to coaching clients as well, right? There's a million ways to be a leader. The way that I lead is not that way that somebody else lead and or the, how they should be leading. So your the line of inquiry that we're on right now reminds me of my early days in coaching. And I remember feeling that if I didn't have the answer, the client would fire me. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You're smiling too. I'm so, so glad yeah. that's gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you remember that feeling. I remember it well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And um, for me, the feeling is not only, was not only rooted in the newness to coaching that I was experiencing, but a role that I played going back to even childhood where uh, it was really important that I would have the answer. Hmm. Um, and I wonder if you can relate to that. I relate to that in a somewhat different way because what's rooted in my childhood is that my brother and my dad always knew everything and definitely better than me. So they were never wrong. So I couldn't really win. Right. So um, it wasn't really my advice that was there, but this experience led me to either rebel or it led me to ultimately my coaching journey is based in that. Right. To uh, go into a profession where there isn't a right because there's just your right and there's my right, you know, so. I, I have understood over the years, that's why it's important to do your own work, right? That uh, that's what's being triggered. 
And I still have those responses and want to argue with the client occasionally that, uh, but this is right. Um, and that's still alive. I, I just learned to notice it early and not let it interfere with the work that we're doing. Yeah, I, 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 I can't help but, but speak because, I'm, because I'm, I'm speaking right now to clearly an experienced coach. Um, I want to identify some of the things that I'm feeling and seeing in our conversation. Mm -hmm. One is a few minutes ago, I, I talked about having one eye inward and one eye outward. And I think that you just demonstrated mm -hmm. what I was just talking about. You're, you're simultaneously aware of the propensity to do a certain thing mm -hmm. and its roots while simultaneously looking out to the other in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's quite skillful. Um, I'm also, when you talked about your brother and your father, I felt uh, a little sadness. Mm -hmm. And I felt that, that uh, I had an image of a boy being uh, overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And I felt real empathy. Mm -hmm. And I knew what that was like for me. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and now, because this is like meta, 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 <laughs> um, I feel closer to you mm -hmm. yeah. because and of all of those experiences. Yes, and that's why I'm quite comfortable. I think it's even important that we reveal ourselves. But then my wife is a Lacanian psychoanalyst. Right. So the, I live with an analyst <laughs> that uh, I'm sure evokes many stereotypical assumptions for people, but it's actually really amazing. Not that uh, she's analyzing me in a stereotypical way, but uh, right. her position of you lose the position of the analyst as soon as you reveal who you are as a person. And my background is, is in, true. Yeah, my foundation is existentialism. Right. That's how I've entered mm -hmm. coaching. So uh, writings of Irvin Yalom, for example, writes beautifully about existential therapy, which, you know, has a lot of parallels with existential coaching. It's, an, it's the stance of you and the client are in relation. And if you reveal yourself as a person, uh, as an analyst, you lose your position. If you reveal yourself as a person, um, then you allow you and your client to connect on that personal level. And it makes them feel safe because it makes them feel they're talking to a real person. You know, and it, 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 there's a lot of dangers with that, and a lot of pitfalls potentially. Um, uh, so there really I, isn't I, a r better way, I think, to work with someone. They're just very different ways of working with someone. They're very, very different ways, and and I think this is this is part of the the challenge is that the that the the, the therapeutic aspect that may show up in a coaching relationship is not the point of the relationship. Right. Uh, whereas the point of an analytic relationship is therapy. Right. Um, and and uh, it takes skill to navigate both sides. Um, I can make an argument uh, that an analyst who is so hard and fast as to never reveal themselves may, in fact, uh, get lost and undermine some aspects of the transference, mm -hmm. transferential aspect of the relationship. Um, uh, think of the classic story making that a client may make to tell themselves about the, the, the authority figure who is the analyst who never reveals himself. It may mm -hmm. be very similar to having a parent who's never actually showed up mm. in a powerful way. So um, there's a line that my former analyst used to use with me all the time. When, we, when I started learning to coach, she used to say, there's a right way, there's a wrong way, and there's a way that works. <laughs> and, and I think that that framing is really important because it places on all of the helping folks the burden of saying, is this working or not? Mm -hmm. Because that can't be on the client. Yeah. That has to be on the person who's holding that position. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I mean, she would also pair it with, you meet the client where they are. 
And what she would mean by that is if the client comes at you with pragmatic, 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 then you respond with pragmatic, 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 mm -hmm. so that you build the trust in the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and then you slowly evolve and, 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 and perhaps may at that point, you may start to reveal, or at, at that point, you may start to inquire more deeply in a particular vein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Th this, this, by the way, is one of the reasons why I think coaching by human beings and not algorithms mm -hmm. um, is incredibly important. Because the algorithms, and no matter how sophisticated the AI is, mm -hmm. the algorithms are never going to be able to feel their way into what's working, what's not working, mm -hmm. you know, in that moment. So. Yeah. Oh, that's a whole nother conversation that we could have. <laughs> because I, <laughs> I know there's a lot of talk around AI and will it replace coaching or at least some coaching. And I think there's probably a point in terms of the performance, pragmatic, transactional kind of coaching. But just what you said just now, I don't see that ever happening either. Um, it's, it's like, I'm not going to fall in love with the AI. I mean, maybe I mean, there are movies about this, but yeah, what well, was it called? Her, I think it was a fantastic yes. movie of this guy falling <laughs> right. in love with the operating system. <laughs> right. But he's clearly projecting, right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> he's falling in love with an aspect of himself. You know, it's narcissism. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> um, but let, let's go a bit deeper in that. I, there was a wonderful lapsus when you were uh, a guest in, on Tim Ferriss's uh, podcast, um, uh, I think earlier this summer. Um, you, we talk, you talked about uh, the importance of taking sabbaticals and having some time and really disconnecting. And at some point you said that it makes you a better therapist, uh, a better coach. <laughs> and <laughs> I just absolutely loved that. So... Given that it's deep inquiry, right, and given the importance that you put uh, on childhood experiences and that you often seem to go there, regardless of how the coaching goes, at some point you seem to go there, take the doors that have just been knocked on or opened and really inquire deeply into how you became the person that you are now. Um, so coaching therapy i've heard you tell another story on the coaches rising podcast about how you've coached someone but it was i think it was something around an intervention around his dead father and if he were there right now um so there there's clearly a very therapeutic element to it and i i wonder how if at all you draw the line or whether that's even important well i do draw the line and i do think it's important um, and I draw a line, um, for example, if a client is consistently showing up with acute depression, then my job becomes to encourage them to seek um, uh, professional help in that context. Mm -hmm. um, if what we're seeing is um, instead is a pattern in their work lives, where they are, to use a classic example, I often speak to conflict avoidant. Understanding the roots of that conflict avoidance, I think is essential to being able to create the transformation necessary. Mm -hmm. So the way I think about it is, um, um, and the way I was trained as a coach is to think about the presenting agenda that the client shows up with and then move as quickly as possible to the, what's called the, transfer, the transformational agenda. Mm -hmm. What is really at work here? Mm -hmm. What are they really looking for? Yeah. And um, I don't think anyone calls a coach because they're happy with the status quo, hmm. right? And so- Wouldn't that be it, nice? <laughs> <laughs> it would be kind of boring, I don't know. Um, and so I think, you know, what we're, what, the, the, where the parallels may be is in that wish for transformation, is in that wish for this is not working and I need something new. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, I think if there's a strong parallel, um, I often think of the work of Carl Rogers 
and some and Marty Seligman from Positive Psychology at the at Penn. Um, I think that there is a um, uh, or cognitive behavioral therapy. I think that there is uh, there is a kind of uplifted looking backward that uh, good coaching should be based around. Uh, uh, what I often say to a client is we'll open up the closet. Let's straighten out all the stuff that you've got shoved in shoe boxes mm -hmm. and then put it back. Mm -hmm. Cause our job isn't to hang out in the closet. Our job is to hang out in the rest of the house. Mm -hmm. And so what we're really trying to do is understand how, the, you know, as I said in my book, how who you were shows up and how who you are now. Mm -hmm so that you can make conscious choices about who you'd like to be. Yeah, and that's where we work with the present and going forward. But as part of that is how we show up in the present is rooted in our past. So I often hear coaches make the distinction between coaching and therapy as, well, therapy is about the past and the present. Coaching is about the present and the future, but the present is the past in a way. The, the, what, what did Faulkner say? The past is never uh, uh, dead. It's not even in the past. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's always present. Hmm. It's always present. Um, I think sometimes, sometimes that split that you just defined uh, may stem from a coach being really uncomfortable hmm. in the messiness that mm -hmm. the past can be, mm -hmm. um, perhaps because they haven't done their own work or perhaps because they are organized to look for um, simple uh, methodological based answers mm -hmm. to complex questions. Mm -hmm. Like I show up with anger at work all the time so what are you going to do? Snap a rubber band around your wrist to make you not angry anymore? I mean, there is, there is a little some bit value. of that. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, there, there's some magical thinking in, in that, that that's somehow going to create the transformation that the client deserves. Well, it's going to shift the symptom to somewhere it's else. It's going to shift the symptom. You got it. You got <laughs> it. It's just going to show up in some other way, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our job is, as my doctor, you know, my analyst used to say, to meet the client where the client is, mm -hmm. to bring our whole selves, and to recognize when we're out of our depth, when we're when when it's better to then turn to say your wife and say, "Here's an analyst that you might consider. Mm -hmm. right? If you want to go deeper on this subject, here is somebody that you might consider. Here's a book you might read that mm -hmm. will take you in that direction." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a two distinctions in there that is, I think, much more helpful to think about is that um, particularly the one about the resourcefulness, right? If the client is whole, you know, and it can be difficult for people to wrap their head around somebody being whole and somebody struggling, you know, somebody having some stuff from their past that is deeply rooted and really in the way of them moving forward. But if the client feels resourced in terms of being able to open those doors and not being able to stop crying for an hour, you know, but they're actually able to go through those doors and do some exploring. It might be difficult and there might be emotions and there might be tears, but you know, in essence, the client is resourced into that kind of inquiry. And the second one is as a coach, are you willing and are you able to hold that kind of space for someone? And I think there's people who are willing to hold that space, but don't really have the necessary skills or haven't, done the work, so they're getting involved, they're getting triggered, their own stuff comes in and it's not helpful or they don't know what to do with all of that emotion or, you know, or they, they might just don't not want to. Uh, one of my early coaching trainers, um, he always said, uh, he, has a, he was a therapist, trained therapist, but at some point decided not to offer a therapy anymore. So he would refer even though he had the skills. And I think that's absolutely okay. I, I, I think it's actually high integrity mm -hmm. um, because he's living into, you know, his stated wish to transfer, transfer into a different modality. 
Mm-hmm. But if I can go back to, to, to the earlier part of that, that observation you were making, I think that one of the challenges, I mean, I think you said it well, but one of, one of the challenges for, for all of us, and this includes leaders, our clients, as well as coaches, is first of all, do we actually believe our clients are whole? Hmm. Or do we secretly wish, or do mm-hmm. we secretly hold the belief that they are in fact broken, mm-hmm. that they are in fact a problem that needs fixing? Mm-hmm. And if we're holding that wish or that belief, I'm revealing myself, Uh then is that in fact a wish? Mm -hmm. Because if the client is whole, then why are they talking to me? Mm -hmm. Right? See, if we go into that relationship thinking that our job there is to fix the client and the client, and it works against this notion of the wholeness of the client, Yeah. Um, which then undermines my own position. Yeah. The second thing is if we are if we are faced with an overwhelming set of emotions, do we know? I mean, you said it well, do we know how to hold those feelings mm-hmm. without it triggering our own sense of helplessness? Mm-hmm. And maybe even an urgent desire to fix it. Shh, don't cry. Right, that kind of an experience of like, oh no, make it better. We'll make it better. I'm sorry, I opened that door for you. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you know, this requires an, an enormous amount of skill and nuance and um, mm-hmm. self awareness and having mm-hmm. done your own work. Mm. Yeah, I I wanted to challenge you on that earlier. Uh, I didn't feel the right time, but. Uh... I really fundamentally believe that if nothing's wrong, people would benefit enormously from coaching. And mm-hmm. I see that particularly in supervision. I would want any coach to be in supervision. I would actually want anybody who works, not just with people, but anybody who works to be in supervision. Supervision, <laughs> not as in having somebody superior, but having somebody on the balcony who's able to pick up on those kind of dynamics who can help you reflect on your work. And what I see a lot with coaches coming to supervision, um, more and more they come because they think supervision is important. And I am so happy about that. So I would want them uh, once they start that journey in supervision, they then book sessions only when some something is broken or they're stuck or they don't know what to do with a client. Something feels broken. Um, yeah. and, and I would really want, I mean, in supervision, it helps. Some of my best learning in supervision I got when everything was going splendid and I didn't even know what to bring to the session. And yeah. I now offer that uh, question to clients that don't know what to bring. Um, groups, for example, are fantastic because people turn up to a group and they don't book a session. The group happens monthly. So they're right. like, oh, I don't really know what to bring. How about your last session? How about the one right. from this morning? And right. there's right. so much learning every time. And that's the same with coaching clients, right? Somebody can have a fantastic, everything's running smoothly, but there's always something to learn. There's always grow, uh, insight. Nothing needs to be broken in order to learn. So I, I wish I, okay. it was not the case. I, can can I wholeheartedly endorse what you've just said? Please, um, <laughs> uh, you know, a client clients often ask, "What is the the number one question that you should ask a prospective coach?" And I always say, "Are you in coaching or supervision or therapy yourself?" Mm-hmm. Because if you're not, um, and this is the the only, I have a little quibble with the word supervision, be, only in the sense that it implies a connection to the training program. And it oh. implies that when training is over, I no longer need supervision. Oh, really? I would oh. argue that as long as you are mucking around the psyche oh. of human oh, yeah. beings, you need to keep your own work going. Hmm. Because, you know, I'm in, I, I go to therapy twice a week and I'm in a group su- a supervision group once a week. Um, and I intend to do that for as long as I'm out in the world. Yeah. Because, you know, our own stuff is wily. Our own stuff can show up. Yeah. And, and you're right. I, th- I think every one of those conversations is enormously helpful and, and makes me a better coach without, without yeah. a doubt. Well, so uh, quickly, I, what... I, I agree with you completely. 
Yeah, quickly, where, where's that association with a training coming from? Um, supervision. I, I just training. think of the, I, it's it's just my own feeling. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I think of supervision. Like I, most coach training programs I know use the word supervision, whereas I think psychological, you know, psychotherapeutic organizations refer to supervision as an ongoing practice. Um, and I think that, that you know, I, my preference would be that the coaching profession sees supervision as a necessary component to certification, to, to, um, to maintenance of myself as a coach, mm. right? It's, it's absolutely essential. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> it's becoming yeah. more important and people are more yeah. aware of it. And I also seen that trend that coaches go deeper and deeper and the lines between coaching and therapy get blurrier and blurrier. Yeah. Because yeah. there's just so much going on for people. And uh, yeah. you know, yeah. we would be quite limited, I think, if we not yeah. talk about emotions, for example. Well, I, I, I agree with that observation. And I would add to the observation that there's this other trend, which is the counter trend, which is, is certainly here in the United States, um, because there is no requirement for any certification to call oneself one a coach. Mm -hmm. There is also a, a blurring uh, at, the, at the other end where people are conflating mentoring uh, advising, consulting mm -hmm. with okay. coaching. And, and, uh, and so what coaching is becomes this very, very uh, unclear and ambiguous state mm -hmm. uh, in sort of somewhere between, say, mentoring and psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah, and I see, I talk to more and more people, coaches who say, I'm not interested in the lines anymore because I work with people and if they feel they find this valuable and they want to do more of it, then let's do more of it. What works, right? There's a right way, right. wrong way, and there's a way that works. I, I wonder how you think about that because it, it certainly can help to put more of a frame around a profession, but it seems that some of the blessing and the, the curse of coaching, of the coaching profession is that it is so incredibly open. And if you say I'm a coach, most people can't possibly know what that means unless you kind of explain a little bit how you approach the work. Uh, do we well, need more they, regulation? I think that there's there are a couple of things uh, that I would say. One is, and I often think of uh, the poet E. e. Cummings, who would often break the rules as it related to, say, capitalization and punctuation. Mm -hmm. But it's clear from his writing that he knew the rules. Mm -hmm. Right. And so um, I think that that it's very, very important that one understand the rules, understand, you know, some of the things we were talking about before about transference, counter transference and mm -hmm. projection and what's happening. And I can't tell you the number of coach training programs that I am aware of that actually don't talk about things like projection. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you can do yeah. this job without huh. talking about that. Right. With regard to regulation, possibly, possibly, but I think that there's actually a greater need for a constant articulation of the ethics mm -hmm. of this relationship. And I'm not sure that regulation leads to reinforcement of the ethics. Mm -hmm. One would hope it does, mm -hmm. but there are plenty of people, there are plenty of people both from a therapeutic perspective or from a coaching perspective who follow all the regulations mm -hmm. and yet are unethical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because ethics is, a serious, ethics is a series of questions you need to ask yourself rather than a rule book. It, it's, it's, well, here's an, I, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I think the answer to should you sleep with a client <laughs> is unequivocal, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Should you uh, take advantage of the transferential relationships so that you can manipulate the client? Oh yeah, no. there's some there's <laughs> some that do, most people agree. With. Although there was sex therapy in the seventies, you know, they they thought right. that could cure people. Right. right. <laughs> well, yeah. What was going on there? Right? So, <laughs> going, so, yeah. so, you know, I mean, I I do think that there are there are. Um, 
really moral and ethical questions that are applied in all of our interpersonal relationships and all of our dynamics. Mm -hmm. And there is a power differential mm -hmm. that exists and being aware of all of that. Um, and I don't know of a lot of regulations that actually prevent, right? I mean, mm -hmm. in the United States, psychotherapists are highly regulated, right? If you're certified in one state, you may not be able to to provide services in another state, mm -hmm. which in the age of Zoom is an interesting challenge, right? Mm -hmm. But um, but uh, there's nothing in the regulations that would necessarily say, and uh, don't use uh, the relationship to manipulate the client to make yourself feel better. Mm -hmm which I think a heck of a lot of folks do. Mm. So anyway, long-winded response. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I wanted to ask you about the, the importance of your own story, and that is one's own story as well, right? Because it, it strikes me that a lot of the coaches that are out there inspiring a lot of people, a lot of the very successful coaches, certainly, they seem to have lived through really heavy experiences. You were in a very deep, dark place at some point, which you write about in your book. Um, I, I recently had a, another coach um, um, uh, see a session, and he's, he's been close to death a couple of times. And I, I, it's this kind of experience that gives a lot of coaches this presence to sit with someone and hold that kind of space. Um, I've been blessed with a, you know, not very traumatic childhood, as I would say. I mean, other than uh, what I've shared, it's not had that kind of impact um, that I would consider myself traumatized in any way, right? So I've, I've had a pretty, uh, pretty good life and pretty fortunate not to have been um, in really deep, dark places. I mean, I had my fair share of existential crises, but you know, compared to uh, your story, other people's story, it's, it, it, it doesn't quite go to that kind of level. And Irvin Yalom, who I mentioned before, uh, he's lost his wife during the writing of his latest book. And then he's reflecting on that. And he said he's a better therapist for it, having been able to relate to bereavement in a different way now. So I, I guess the question here is to what extent do we have, have to live through similar experiences? And is that helpful or might that be in the way when we work with people? Remember what I said before, the move that I often make, I'm about to make this move. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll answer your question, but humor me for a moment. Sure. Ask the question again, but put an I statement in it instead of a you statement or a generalized pronoun statement. Huh. Ask the question from another yeah, yeah. place. I wonder. I wonder to what extent is it in the way or beneficial for me to have gone to a similar place or experience that my client is bringing into the room. So let me reflect back the question I'm hearing, and you tell me if this resonates. Hmm. You seem to be wondering if your lack of trauma gets in the way of you being the best possible coach you can be. Yeah, there's something that definitely resonates. Stay with that question for a moment. Yeah. yeah. There's a, um, right, I was trained phenomenologically, right? in the existential frame, the notion that my experience is not like anybody's experience, even if we both got married or got our dream job or lost our parents or had a near death experience, nearly drowning. Everybody's experience is completely different. So what I experience isn't really important for me to be the best possible coach I can be in this regard, right? Um, I've been exploring for a number of years to work with psychedelics and what coaching could offer to that kind of space. 
And pretty much everybody I talk to uh, in the psychedelic community says, yes, absolutely, you have to have had all of your experiences and you need to have gone and you can't take a client further than you have gone before. And with my phenomenological stance, I can't help but challenge that because I don't need to have been a CEO to work with a CEO and help give them a space to reflect, right? I don't need to know what it's like to be working in insurance or to become a parent. You know, I have become a parent recently. Is that gonna make me a better coach to another parent having parent issues? I don't think so, you know, but so I've been I, I, faced. I, 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 yeah, I see you working it out in your own mind. I hmm. see you hearing a kind of whispery voice that says, because I did not experience a particular trauma, I may not be the kind of coach that I'd like to be. But then what comes up quickly is uh, a, a, a honestly felt but somewhat intellectual response, which <laughs> yeah. is, you know, well, the phenomenologists have shown that our, since our experiences are unique, right? So, and so you're, 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 you're grappling with it. I see hmm. that. Hmm. Okay. I appreciate your sharing that because it helps me understand even better the roots of the question. Because I could feel that tension that was going on inside of you. <clears throat> I come, I'm highly influenced, you know, we've been talking a lot about therapy, but I've also been highly influenced by my faith, uh, my spirituality in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the uh, core tenets is the primacy of compassion. Uh, and, and a root capacity that builds compassion is empathy, mm -hmm. which of course relies upon the ability to have one eye looking inward, to understand your own experience, mm -hmm. so that I can have a connection with the other person and from, to bring it back into coaching so that I can create the presence necessary for that client's transformation. So I can be a facilitator for that client mm -hmm. to have the life that they want. Mm -hmm. You may not have had, you're right, from a phenomenological point of view, your experience is different than mine. We could have had exactly the same experiences of trauma and you'd still have a different experience. Mm, yeah. That's my siblings, right? Mm -hmm. But I would argue there, there are universal experiences. They're feelings. Mm -hmm. And in the moment in which you're trying to create an empathetic bridge in which the client can then, using com with your compassion, client can then do the transformation that they deserve. Mm -hmm you can reach in to know what it feels like to have your heart broken, mm -hmm. even if you did not go through a divorce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know what it's like to stare at something that you love wholeheartedly, even if you didn't give, you know, become a parent. Mm -hmm. right? You can connect to those feelings. Yeah. And in that connection, you create the opportunity. Yeah. So that's one thing. I want to close with one additional observation. Can I go just ahead. go, go yeah, in there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because um, I noticed that a lot of really excellent coaches are former or current actors. And mm -hmm. the, I think that's, that's exactly what's happening, right? As an actor, you learn to connect with something within you right. to play the role authentically. You have had a different experience, but you connect to something that is a similar experience and you go into that place and you, you yeah. channel that. So I it's, think that's it's, why that's it's, it's the coaching stance. I mean, you're talking about the Stravinsky method, uh, you know, method acting is that notion of being able to surface that own experience. But I think that that is true for all of our interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, I can imagine 
what it's like to have my heart broken. Mm -hmm. I can imagine what it's like to be fired when I thought I was succeeding. I can imagine what it's like to feel like a failure, yeah. right? Plum but then be careful with the but then be careful with the assumptions that come up. Well, uh, question: Be curious about the assumptions that uh -huh. come up. Use yeah. them as a means of uh, connection and dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other phenomena that I get concerned about when folks I say look at my story and 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 see the experiences of the challenges that I have um, is that they romanticize the challenge. Mm. And they see themselves as less than because they didn't have suicidal ideation at a depression or they didn't act out in some particular way. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, dangerous. And I'll reinforce the, the core message. None of that is necessary for you as a coach to feel compassion. Mm -hmm. That is really empathy based. Mm -hmm. And none of that is necessary for you to be able to use your imagination mm -hmm. to stand shoulder to shoulder with your client mm -hmm. and witness their transformation. Mm -hmm. Right? Because that's, that's the magic. That's the glory. That's what we do. That's why we do what we do. Yeah. You, you mentioned transformation there. You mentioned it earlier. And one question I usually ask guests, right? Because the school is a school that trains uh, coaches in transformative coaching. Um, when you say transformation, what do you what do you mean? What does that mean? Well, I, I'm very very fond of a particular uh, Jungian or Jung quote. Uh, which is until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Mm -hmm. um, it's that moment. To me, that's the ultimate transformation. That's, you know, the subtitle of my book is Leadership in the Art of Growing Up. And people will often say, well, what is, a, what is an adult? What is a grown up mm -hmm. in that way? And it's someone who is committed to that process of transformation on a daily basis basis. It's a practice of transformation. It's a practice of growing up. Mm -hmm. It's a practice of staying awake. Mm -hmm. And when we fall back asleep, we wake up again. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm having an eye on the time. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I still wanted to ask, and it's more on the practical side of things, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Coaches love it when they have something they can put into practice. And I've picked up a bunch of really, really good questions that you seem to ask your clients often. So I wonder if you could share some of those questions um, that you often find yourself asking a client that seems to open certain doors. Well, the, the famous one, which I wish I would get a penny for every time it's repeated on the internet, <laughs> I'm kidding, it is, um, Uh, how have I been complicit in creating the conditions I say I don't want? Um, I, wish, I wish I had a penny for the times that you have mentioned it in your book. <laughs> right, right. Well, and it's really important that I talk about complicity, not responsibility, um, because it often gets misunderstood as me trying to invoke a sense of guilt or shame. It's not. It's really mm -hmm. curiosity. But I think that the more important question, the question that isn't so widely discussed is how has that benefited me? Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, if we think about what uh, our clients come in and, uh, and they'll say, you know, they, you know, this is happening again. And it's like, well, let's look at the secondary benefit mm -hmm. because I firmly believe that uh, patterns persist because they meet a need. Hmm. How's this serving you, right? And if it doesn't meet a need, it's not going to repeat itself. So, and until you get that need met, you're going to keep repeating that pattern. Yeah. So I think that that's a really, really interesting framing. I would argue that that's an essential question in coaching mm -hmm. is, is to really look at the way in which whatever it is that they're coming in with their presenting agenda is in service to them. Mm -hmm. And then what is it, how else might they get that need met? Mm -hmm. other than the behavior that they so desperately want to change. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's inviting to take responsibility. In what ways are you complicit to what's happening here? And I love how you lay it out as well in terms of uh, what was that? You worked with someone and said, oh, my CFO, there's a greediness. Head of sales. Head of yeah. sales. Yes, exactly. And, and well, who hasn't fired him? Who has hired him? <laughs> who chose to promote him? <laughs> and if you do that in a safe space, then, you know, the That's client right. might as well uh, go on some introspection. And uh, That's right. I'm a big That's fan right. of inviting people to take responsibility. And if a client then get gets defensive or guilty or ashamed. That's something to be very curious about. That's right. That's right. That's right. You had a few questions there around um, what needs to be said that isn't currently being said. And there were two other versions of that questions. Um, yeah. Well, let me restate them. So, so uh -huh. the first one is, what am I not saying that needs to be said? Uh -huh. And that's a really, really powerful question because we often, especially those of us who grew up with violence, often train ourselves to say nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's a really, really curious question. And then the corollary questions to that are, are uh, what am I saying that's not being heard? Mm -hmm. And that speaks to, to not being listened to. Mm -hmm. And then, especially for those of us who have power, what's being said that I'm not hearing? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, those who have less power than we do will speak with other than words. Uh -huh. so they might speak oh, yeah. with actions. Yeah. And so if somebody is consistently late to their job, what's really being said there? Uh -huh. And get curious about that. Yeah. Great. Any, any others? Well, and that this really speaks to the, the work that I'm, the, the book I'm working on now, which from my lips to God's ears will be out this summer. Oh, great. Uh, I don't need to ask you about it now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, uh, how have I been complicit in and benefited from the conditions in society I say I don't want? Hmm. Say a bit more. Right. Sure. So we live in a world where folks' belonging is constantly challenged, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, by dint of a darker pigmentation whether it's by an immigrant status, mm -hmm. whether it's by religion, by, by economic status. And we all benefit from these conditions in some way. And the lack of curiosity. So it's like taking those self-inquiry questions that are sort of internally focused and really looking out at the larger world and say, how have I benefited from this? And what would I give up that I love mm -hmm. in order to see that condition change? Mm -hmm. Am I willing, for example, to put my safety on the line mm -hmm. and my sense of uh, wholeness mm -hmm. in order to lean into difficult conversations? Um, am I willing to be wrong mm -hmm. in order to learn? Mm -hmm. That, so. that feels like there's a, a more systemic angle, like a reboot feels quite personal. This seems to be going more outward. That's exactly what this is. This book is called Reunion, and it's really looking at the phenomena of othering that occurs in multiple layers within mm -hmm. uh, our society and our organization. And the, and the question really is, what is the, the, the person who's well-intentioned, who leads with a certain kind of eth ethics, I've done my work implicit in Reboot. Now I want to see this manifested in a different world. What mm -hmm. if, for example, the purpose of a business was not just simply the amassing of wealth, mm -hmm. but the creation of belonging on a systemic mm -hmm. basis? Mm -hmm. What if we turned our organizations from a means of extraction into the means of generation of love, safety, and belonging? for everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's what the new book is about. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> well, thank you for that work, because mm -hmm. it's sure very necessary if we, you know, want to have a chance. So that's right. Um, that's right. That's mm -hmm. right. We have, I think we have a moral obligation to ask ourselves those questions. I really mm -hmm. do. Yeah. Jerry, 
I want to thank you. Thank you so much for making time. Um, I remember fondly when I was on a research journey to look at who writes about existential leadership. And mm -hmm. I found a couple of quotes by you that I absolutely loved. And ever since then, uh, I kind of wanted to talk to you, but you know, it took a while. So I'm, I'm glad that it happened. Um, mm -hmm. I would recommend any coach to, uh, to read Reboot uh, because it, you, you prose it in, in questions. Each chapter has a question of self-inquiry and there's so many coaching questions in there that I think mm -hmm. would be, it's just very practical and mm -hmm. embedded in a wonderful story. So I recommend anybody to go there. Uh, the two Tim Ferriss episodes you've done are fantastic. There's a wonderful story about why you have a big spider tattoo on your back. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, go, go there, you know, read, please go engage with Jerry um, and his work. Um, Jerry, thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, thank you for making the time. And I'll leave it at that. Is there anything else you wanted to tell people? Oh, I just want to. I just want to thank you, Yannick, for for the work that you're doing. It was a thoughtful, engaged conversation, and clearly, you know, you've thought about big issues. And I appreciate your work. And uh, mm -hmm. I want you to enjoy Berlin and enjoy being a parent. My my <laughs> oldest is 32. My youngest is 25. So I, but I do remember eight months old. <laughs> so. <laughs> I think part of parenthood is to forget about these elements so that you can have more children. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Don't worry, you'll sleep again. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's a good baby. <laughs> Jerry, thank you so much. Uh, see you around. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Coaching Uncaged. If you want to find out more about becoming a coach, developing your coaching skills further, or training as a coaching supervisor, then head along to animascoaching.com. Thanks again and catch you on the next episode.